So this section is on gene regulation. Or in other words, even though we have the DNA and we know that DNA codes for things, how do we turn certain areas of DNA on and off? We know this happens during development as you're, as you're forming as an embryo. We know that this is happening in all of your cells all the time because your brain cells are doing completely different things than skin cells, even though both brain cells and skin cells have the same 46 chromosomes. So that's the focus of this. Genes make proteins, but we only need to make certain proteins at certain times. So there has to be some kind of a mechanism by which we can turn genes on and off. And this goes along with what I've mentioned before to you. It's called epigenetics. In other words, the control of the genes, not the genes themselves that code for making brown hair or whatever, but the mechanisms by which those genes are activated in some cells sometimes and not activated in other cells or at other times. So we've studied more than anything else prokaryotes or bacteria, and they use something called the operon. So an operon is a group of genes that have functions that are related to each other, um, and they're all kind of in the same area, grouped together into one nice package unit. So the example of the picture here, um, these genes on the right side happen to be the genes for digesting lactose. So it requires three different enzymes to digest lactose. So how convenient to have the genes for making all three of those enzymes in a row in the same area. That makes perfect sense. So we're going to walk through each of the parts of this operon um, one by one. Technically, there's usually a gap here. I'm just going to draw a little double-stranded DNA here because there's a little gap between this regulator gene and these other parts. Okay, so the first part here is called the promoter, and I'm actually going to define these on another slide, but I want to show you real quick. The promoter is where RNA polymerase binds. So if I use this as RNA polymerase. If you remember, polymerase binds for transcription. It would travel down this operon and basically make mRNA. And then that mRNA would make the enzymes that were needed, in this case, to digest lactose. So again, promoter, this P right here, this is where, where um, polymerase binds. It travels down here. And so as long as there's nothing in the way, this would constantly be in the on position, this operon, constantly producing mRNA to make the enzymes to digest lactose. Now, O here is what's called the operator. And one way to remember this, by the way, is to remember PROG, P-R-O-G. So the promoter was our first thing. This is where mRNA starts transcription. O, the operator, this is a switch. So here's what happens. The operator, this thing here, this uh, that I made, is a repressor protein and it can stick to the operator. So if this sticks to the operator, notice what happens, polymerase can't bind. So now the operon is off, there would be no enzymes made. When this moves out of the way, the operon is now on and it's making the enzymes. So the operator is like a switch that can be turned on or off in this particular um, picture. All right, so let's do a quick walkthrough. And this is called the repressor, this protein, and it's being made by this regulator gene back here, the R. It's making this repressor protein, which can then shut this down. So let's do a quick walkthrough of all the parts that I just mentioned. So first, promoter. Again, the promoter is the place where mRNA binds, uh, I'm sorry, polymerase binds to start transcription. So right here, promoter, and it binds, and transcription can go. Second, the operator, that's our switch. If this is stuck on the operator, this is in the off position. If this is not blocked, this is in the on position. Next, the structural genes. In this case, there's three of them. These are the genes that actually code for what the bacteria needs to make. So this is the part of the DNA that, that's actually important for making something. This back here, you'll notice it's labored regulatory region. This is, is the epigenetics. This is what's controlling whether the genes are turned on or off. So that's our first three parts. And then remember how I told you PROG, P-R-O-G, so promoter, operator, the genes that actually code for things, and the R can actually stand for both of these. The regulator gene is the actual gene that makes the repressor protein, which I was showing you here as this red thing. So the repressor protein is this red thing that can block polymerase. 
and it's made by the regulator gene. And the regulator gene is usually located further away. So if I redraw my operon here real quick, here's my regulator gene, and it codes for making this repressor protein, so also starting with an R. There's a little gap, and on the quiz you'll have to match parts of this. And then here's promoter, operator, which usually looks kind of like, it has a little place for the protein to bind. And then here will be, however many there are, G, your genes. So this is where PROG comes in. P, O, G for the genes, R for the repressor. And then polymerase, again, binds to promoter, and as long as there's nothing blocking it, it travels along here. All right, so that's the general parts of an operon. Let's talk about the two kinds of operons, because there are two. The first kind is called a repressible operon, because it's normally in the on position, but it can be repressed or turned off as needed. So the, the uh, textbook example of the repressible operon is what's called the trip operon. The trip operon is a bunch of enzymes that code for making tryptophan, which is an amino acid. So bacteria need tryptophan all the time, so this operon is usually on because it's making tryptophan all the time. But the bacteria want to have a way of turning it off if needed. For example, what if they're put in an environment where tryptophan is already provided? For example, why should I make dinner if somebody shows up my, at my house with food? So if tryptophan, if they enter an environment where there's tryptophan already present, they can turn this off because why waste energy if they don't need to? Also, maybe they start making it and they, they're not using it as quickly as they make it. So this is our textbook example you should recognize of what's called negative feedback. So tryptophan itself, the product of this pathway, can actually go back and turn the pathway off. How does it turn the pathway off? It activates the repressor protein. So remember, the repressor protein was this thing that I showed you, that was this red starburst. So the repressor is being made all the time, but in this particular operon, it's being made in a form that's not active. What activates it to shut everything down is tryptophan. So let me show you really quick. I have, here's the trip operon. So don't let all this, some of this wording confuse you, and don't let this promoter confuse you. Here's our regulator. And it's making, all the time, the repressor proteins. But notice that it makes them in a shape that's not active. It's not the right shape to shut this down. So this operon is normally on. Here's polymerase, and all of these, trip E, trip D, all of this, these are just the genes for making tryptophan. So now this is in the on position, and we start making tryptophan. So here's all my little tryptophans. Well, what's going to happen is if we're not using it up, it's going to start building up. So tryptophan itself, these little green balls, change the shape of the repressor from the inactive form to the active form. And now, see how it fits here in the operator? Boom. Now this is shut down. As the tryptophan gets used up, this would get pulled off because the little green ball would go away. And you would basically have your inactive repressors, and this would get turned back on. So this is a repressible operon. It's usually in the on position, constantly making its product, which in this case is tryptophan, these little green balls. But if there's too much tryptophan, the tryptophan itself binds to these, changes their shape, and shuts this down. Again, the regulator gene over here that's making these repressors, it's making them all the time. So repressors are constantly being made, but they're just made in an inactive form. Okay. The other kind of operon is called an inducible operon. So an inducible operon is one that's normally off. Remember, the repressible one was usually on because it was making something that the cell needed all the time. A good example of an inducible operon is the operon called the LAC operon. So the LAC operon is, contains the genes to digest lactose. Well, there's no reason for the bacteria to make the enzymes to digest lactose if there is no lactose. So this one is usually off because the repressor proteins, these, are being made in such a way they're already active and so they're already bound to the operator keeping the operon shut off. Lactose is what's called the inducer for this operon. So unlike the other one where too much tryptophan shut it down, lactose is what actually turns this one on. So here is a diagram of the lac operon. So notice in this operon, 
the, in, the, in these uh, proteins, these repressor proteins, are already made in the correct shape. So these are floating around, and this is in the off position. But suddenly, lactose is present. Well, lactose itself will actually change the shape of this protein, deactivate it, and turn the operon on. Now the operon will make these enzymes, these are the genes, promoter, operator, genes. These are the genes for making the enzymes to break down lactose. So this operon is specifically turned on by the presence of lactose. Once all the lactose gets digested, then there won't be any more lactose, and these proteins are then in the shape that shuts this down. So that is called an inducible operon. Now, last but not least, there's something called positive gene regulation. Honestly, I would just like for you to know what cyclic AMP does. So cyclic AMP is an example of an inducer. What it does, it's actually an enhancer, I should say. What it does, think of if you go into your dining room, you probably don't have a light switch that only goes on and off. You probably have a light switch that has, it's like a dimmer switch. I can turn it on a little or I can turn it on a lot. Well, if lactose is present in a cell, that does activate the lac operon. But why, again, waste energy to break down lactose if there's also glucose present? Because glucose requires no energy. It's already broken down. So if there's other stuff to eat, the lac operon will only get turned on a little bit. If there's nothing else to eat, in other words, glucose deprivation, you put it on a Petri dish that's basically agar with just lactose and nothing else, now the bacteria doesn't have a choice. It has to turn this operon on full speed or it's going to starve to death. And so cyclic AMP, C-A-M-P, it builds up when there's nothing else to eat. And it doesn't activate the operon, it enhances it. It basically turns it on full speed. So just know that operons not only can be turned off and on, but in some cases they can be turned on and then enhancers can come in and sort of enhance their speed, turn them on further, make them work faster. And the benefit of that, again, is that just because lactose is present, I don't necessarily want to turn that operon on all the way if there's other food to eat. Again, if I, why should I cook if there's already other food in the house? Uh, you know, somebody already brings me food. But if there's nothing else to eat, I don't have a choice. So cyclic AMP is that enhancer that activates at full speed. Now, eukaryotic organisms don't have operons. Um, but, this is just a picture of cyclic AMP. Again, it just speeds things up. But there are things in us similar to them. We do have enhancers that make DNA and move, uh, get copied faster. We have repressors. We have what's called heterochromatin, which is our, remember, chromatin is DNA and histones, proteins. Heterochromatin is DNA that's really tightly coiled. And euchromatin is chromatin that's loose, so it can be copied. Transcription can occur. Also, we know, this is, again, epigenetics, sometimes our DNA can get what's called methylated. Putting methyl groups on DNA shuts it down. And putting acetyl groups on DNA loosens it and activates it. And this is, again, sometimes, for example, I gave you the example of the mice. Um, the, the, the mother mouse was fed folic acid while she was pregnant. What we know that did was it actually methylated areas of the DNA that coded for things like heart disease and obesity and whatever. Folic acid methylated the DNA so that it never got activated. Um, in other cases, again, certain behaviors, certain foods, um, you know, we don't even completely understand it, will acetylate certain areas of the DNA. So we would want to methylate areas of DNA that code for bad things, but we might want to acetylate areas of DNA that code for good things. And so methylation and acetylation are part of epigenetics, ways that our body, um, oh, sorry, epigenetics, ways that our body can specifically uh, turn on and off certain genes under certain circumstances. And it's something that's really on the forefront now We've done a lot of twin studies on this, for example, where we know twins have identical DNA. Why would one twin get diabetes, for example, and the other not? Well, again, it has to do with some of this stuff, that certain environmental factors being exposed to different things, even just, um, you know, we just know lots of things have an effect on your brain, even just things you see and hear, things you eat, and those, those things can actually cause areas of our DNA to be activated or deactivated and therefore can change us. All right, so that is operons.
you'll on the quiz you'll need to be able to label an operon and match the parts and also know just the definitions of what each of the parts do and inducible versus 